In this video, are we talking about image formation? So here's an overview of what I'll be talking about. And by way of introduction, I want to talk about image formation in very simple terms to start with. So an image is the projection of a 3D scene onto a 2D plane. So here we have a 3D scene which contains a 3D object. And then we have a 2D plane upon which we want to project a 2D image. So what we're aiming for is for the object in the scene to appear as an image on the screen. And we're going to examine the relationship between the 2D image and the 3D object. So we're going to start by talking about pinhole projection, which is the simplest way in which we can form an image on the screen. So what we do is we place a pinhole between the object and the image plane, and we don't allow any other light to pass from the object to the image apart from through the pinhole. Now we're going to draw in the optical axis. This is this dashed line that goes through the pinhole. And then we're going to see how light rays travel from the object to the image. So to start with, We've got a light ray that travels from the bottom of the object through the pinhole and then to the top of the image screen here. We can also have another light ray that passes from the top of the object. So we're just trying to see what happens to individual light rays. And you can see that goes from the top of the object down to the bottom of the object. Finally, we can have one from the center of the object to through the pinhole and that goes onto the image screen as well. And what we can see that will happen is that the object will actually be inverted. It will appear upside down on the screen. So we're going to continue to look at this idea and we're going to draw some extra arrows in. So the first arrow will be from the optical axis to the top of the object. And then we'll trace a ray of light from the top of that arrow to the 2D image. And we'll place another arrow from the optical axis to the top of the image, uh, but because it's inverted, it points down. Now, these two arrows and the light ray form two triangles. So let's see what we mean by this. So there are right angles between the two arrows that we've drawn in and the optical axis and these form right angle triangles so on the object side we can see we've got a right angle triangle and on the image side we've got another right angle triangle now these two triangles are actually similar triangles and that's a very particular mathematical term that describes triangles that have similar angles but not necessarily the same lengths Okay, so let's just go into this in a little bit more detail. So we have theta O for the angle on the object side of the pinhole. And we have theta I for the angle on the image side of the pinhole. Now because these two angles are formed by straight lines that cross over, that means that theta O equals theta I and therefore the two triangles are similar. So because the two triangles are similar, we can actually use this to our advantage. So if we draw a dashed line in at the pinhole and we set up a 3D coordinate system where Y points up, Z points to the right and X sort of comes out of the screen at us, then we can use this to define some variables and look at some equations that describe the situation. So first we hold, first of all, we have F, that's the effective focal length. That's the distance from the pinhole to the image. We also have Z, Z, ZO, which is the distance from the object to the pinhole. We have YI, which is the height of the image. And we're just focusing on the arrow that we drew in and then we also have Y subscript O, which is the height of the object. And again, we're focusing on the arrow 
that we drew from the optical axis to the top of the tree that is shown. Now, because these are similar triangles, the ratios of these lengths will be equal. So yi divided by yo will equal f over zo. So that's an important equation that we can use when describing this situation and conducting calculations. Now, magnification is defined as size of image div divided by size of object. Now, we know that the size of the image is yi, size of object is yo. So again, we've got another equation that can be very useful. That's m equals yi divided by yo. And finally, because we know yi divided by yo equals f over zo, we've got a final equation, which is that m equals f over zo. So the effective, the effective focal length divided by the distance from the object to the pinhole. So these equations are really useful when we're trying to describe pinhole projection and maybe carry out some calculations. So next we're going to look at magnification effects. So if we look at this railway track, as it goes into the distance, the rails become closer and closer together. But we know that in reality, they stay the same distance apart. So they look far apart, close up, and as we go further and further into the distance, the, the tracks appear to become closer and closer together. And that's because the magnification decreases as the object gets further and further away from the pinhole. So we've got the effective focal length that will stay the same for a pinhole projection. But as we go further and further into the distance, ZO will increase. So further away, the further away the object is from the pinhole, the smaller the object will appear in the image. So we could take this sort of image with a pinhole camera as shown here. So we've got a, a box that would be completely sealed up so that no light can get into it other than through the pinhole. There's a screen and typically this would be made from thin paper so that we could see the image from outside the box. And then we have an object outside and the light goes through and forms an image on the screen. And this is something that uh, can actually be made at home or for science projects. And it's quite a common type of, of project that people do to, to demonstrate the pinhole projection. It can be done with quite, quite easily with household objects. Another example of pinhole projection is where, where the chambered Nautilus actually uses a pinhole for its eye. And so it doesn't have a lens there, it just has a hole and the light goes through that hole and forms an image on light sensitive cells. Now, if we switch over to the human eye, that does not use a pinhole, but instead it uses a lens. This has the advantage of being able to collect a lot more light, uh, but the image is still inverted. Now there's a retina at the back. This retina it contains light sensitive cells and it allows the eye to detect the image and send electrical impulses to the brain for image processing. Similarly, the digital camera also has a lens instead of a pinhole. And again, we get image formation, but this time on a CCD or CMOS sensor. So this is light sensitive electronics in the camera that produces signals. And then these signals are processed to create the digital image. So there are different types of lenses that we can use to bend light and form images. Uh, so there are converging lenses and diverging lenses. So in the converging lenses, we have double convex, also known as biconvex. There's also plano convex. So the plano refers to the flat portion and the convex 
refers to the bulging side. We also have converging meniscus and this is contrasted by the diverging meniscus in the diverging lenses. Also in the diverging lenses we have double concave, also referred to as biconcave and plano concave. Now if we look at the surfaces of the converging meniscus we see that as they go to the edges they converge and if we look at the surfaces of the diverging meniscus they diverge as we go to the edges. Now different lenses actually bend the light and focus the light in different ways and we're actually going to just focus on the double convex lens. So a double convex lens is formed by the overlap of two circles. So here we have a center and a circle surrounding it and then we can bring in a second circle with a center and where these overlap that is how we form our double convex lens. The distance from center one to the back of the lens surface is radius one and then from center two to the front surface is radius two. So we're actually going to draw a ray diagram now using this information. So a light ray enters the lens and then we can draw a normal line from center two and that will go through the front surface of the lens where the light ray hits. Now because this is circular the light ray will hit at that point and refract and the, the normal there is at 90 degrees to the front surface of the lens. We can actually use Snell's law to calculate the angle of refraction and then it's going to hit the back surface of the lens. Now this time we need to draw the normal line in from center one and that normal line will be at 90 degrees to the back surface. We can then use Snell's law again to work out the angle of refraction. And if we draw in the principal axis, also known as the optical axis, we can determine the focal point for the lens. And we say that the point right in the center of the lens, so halfway from the front to the back is the optical center. Now from the optical center to the focal point is referred to as the focal length. And that's an important feature, an important variable that we need to know and, and use when we're looking at lenses and image formation. So that's been a video about image formation. I hope you found that useful. Please remember to like, comment and subscribe and thanks very much for watching.